6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Manchester 1, United have zero. reached the promised land. Good morning, people. Well, good morning. Morning, everybody. It's Monday morning, the 25th of April. Another weekend, another result where we don't really want to speak too much about the football, but we have to. And we've really got to talk about the fallout from that game, the reaction that we've seen, and the stories that have been emerging about what we all know, right, is a broken dressing room at Manchester United. And this really is a case of there's no smoke without fire. So good morning to all of you. I hope you had a decent weekend. I hope United's early kickoff and early capitulation on Saturday didn't ruin your weekend. I'm sure it didn't because, let's be honest, I think we all expected it. It's not been uh, it's not been pretty the last few weeks. But if we're looking for a silver lining, uh, it gives Ralph Randnick the opportunity to really, and I think he is, brutally assess this squad and give Eric Ten Hag the best possible understanding and knowledge of what he's walking into. Who's down here in the comments this morning? Good morning to Anzac Day in Australia. Not, not sure what that means, but I'm happy for you, T. Good morning to you, T. Uh, good morning to you, Peter, Paula. <laughs> Peter and Paula. <laughs> good morning to you all. Take off. Gungshi, I can see there is always Yoda. Uh, look, good morning to lots of you down in the comments. And I po- apologize. Klein, you're there as well. Uh, apologize if if I missed any of your names. Who, who's on Facebook, by the way? We've got Femi. We've got James Maycox. Good morning to you. And Brendan watching from Minneapolis. Ah, I've always, from day one, praised Ralph Radnick's onitude, onitude, honesty and attitude an approach to speaking to the media for, for for me and for a lot of United fans, it was a breath of fresh air. So we're here with this story has come out over the weekend, right? It's coming from Steve Bates in the mirror. And so many of you would immediately go, hold, hold up, Sam. Why, we're not we're not taking this as gospel, are we? It's the mirror. And I will agree with that in part. But what I'm saying here is there is no smoke without fire. This story here inside details of Ralph Radnick's dossier for Eric Ten Hag on selfish Manchester United players. There really is no smoke without fire. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. Uh, we've seen to be forgotten about... T- da- <laughs> Reset. We seem to have forgotten about Donny. I think he'll be a starter for Ten Hag. And that's asked by Salt. Um, I don't know whether he'll come in and be a starter straight away at all. But Donny van der Beek will literally be like a new signing. I know it's a cliche sometimes, but it really will be like a new signing. But so many of us want to see stuff like this coming out from Ralph Rennick, to hear from the man himself about the problems that we can see inside this squad. And I'm going to run through this article in a bit of detail. But what I'm saying here is there's no smoke without fire. This, of course, happened at the weekend as well. Paul Scholes, when he was uh, speaking with DAZN, Dazen? Dazen? I've never had to pronounce it. He was a pundit out in Canada. Uh, said, I had a quick chat with Jesse Lingard there. I'm sure he won't mind me saying the dressing room is a disaster. So Jesse Lingard there, speaking to Skulls. Scott McTominay after the game. There's a whole load of problems in terms of players, staff, anything within higher up. That's been written wrong. We need to just concentrate on what happens on the pitch. So you can talk about denouncing Steve Bates as a reliable source and whether we can take it as any utterly credible information and I will also come back to you straight after that and say, literally after the game, Jesse Lingard said the dressing room did a disaster. Scott McTominay said we've got problems in terms of players and staff. Two different players both coming out and saying that there are problems within the club. And then this came out on, was it Saturday night? I think it was. Yeah, it was Saturday night. I'm going to run through this full article with you this morning, all right? We're going to dissect every single point that's raised by Steve Bates and we'll debate it as we always do in the comments. But it's... It's kind of a weird... Look, I don't want to look at the end of this season as anything positive because it's not. But I'm trying to take some sort of positive look on it because it's what I always do. Uh, and if there's any way that would really have exposed the problems at this club, no, nothing could have done it more than these last few weeks of football. There is no place any of these players can hide anymore. And something that I really have started to see is a difference in the spikiness, I think, of Ralph Ragnick. I don't think he's being impolite. 
I don't think he's throwing anybody under the bus. But he's definitely being a little bit more spiky in how he's approaching the media and in what he is saying. And I think he's just reached a certain point, which is what's written inside this article. He's reached a certain point where I think Ralph is losing a bit of that, um, yeah, a bit of that politeness where I don't think he wants to defend these players anymore. Um, good morning. To, there's so many down in the comments. Luke Hayes, Sar, good morning to you. Top Dog, Victor, Woodsy, B Rangy. Nice to see you all here this morning. Let's run through this together. And as always, you let me know what you think about this during the stream. You get interactive, get in the comments. I try and respond to as many as I possibly can. And I don't ignore anybody, just as a lot of comments coming in. Let's read through the article. The inside details of Ralph Rannick's dossier for Eric Ten Hag on the selfish Manchester United players. Ralph Rannick will present incoming boss Eric Ten Hag with a shocking dossier. That's a very uh, <laughs> Sunday mirror bit of language there. Yeah? Of shame. Shocking dossier of shame on every United first team player. After talks with Murto and Arnold, the interim Old Trafford chief has been asked to hand Ten Hag a brutal no holds barred rundown on the players that he will inherit this summer. And Ratnick won't hold back after believing he's been let down and hung out to dry by a dressing room he's privately branded, selfish, overinflated, lacking quality and way too powerful. Senior sources inside United's Carrington training ground say Ratnick has been staggered by the lack of professionalism amongst the first team squad. So there's a few points there to dissect and you can let me know what you think about them before, before in the comments. I seem to have lost my ability to speak English this morning. Probably because it's Monday morning. Everyone's a little bit sluggish on Monday morning. United players have been sluggish for a lot, a lot longer than one morning, though. The idea that Ragnick there is, is branding the players selfish, overinflated, lacking quality, and they're too powerful. Now, of course, this could just be Steve Bates jumping on a narrative that's happening, seeing what the conversation is, and writing an article to fit that agenda has to be considered inside this situation but if I really was to do a deep dive into this and present evidence there's so much evidence to support all of these claims across the course of the season it's been staggering I would say how selfish these players have looked and I, I've overinflated I've said this on more than one occasion that I really genuinely think these players have got a massive heightened sense of self-importance Harry Maguire's interview before that Liverpool game was the probably the worst example I've seen of it. I'll be completely honest. And that's not an agenda against Harry Maguire. It's just the worst. He's literally didn't have the awareness that his season has been that bad or he thought that he's better than he, than he is or he was. He's like, two managers have put me in the starting 11 every week. I must be doing something, right? No. I just think he cost 80 million and the club is like... <sighs> we've really got to keep him in the team. Let me see what you're saying down here. Or you're saying, so essentially Ralph has just said, we've all been thinking for a long time. And Stefan, you're saying, but that is exactly the right way. Finally, we're getting rid of the clutter. We haven't acted like this since Fergie. Uh, and Nelly, you're saying everything that Ralph has said is true. And Mark, you're probably not wrong here. He says, yeah, I could deep dive into um, what we've seen this season, but I could go a lot further and a lot deeper than that to prove that what he said so far in this article it's completely true and correct. There hasn't been an utter, utter lack of professionalism from these players, man. I look, and I, I know as fans, we've got a deeper connection to United than, of, of course, than any other football fans would. That's, that's what happens when you follow a club. It's tribalism. That's what supporting a club is all about. But the utter lack of professionalism in this side. Football players these days, I think, are a little bit less connected to their clubs than football players back in the day. I think that's just the way that football culture and football players have gone. So I'm not expecting these players to literally love and bleed and die for the shirt that they're wearing. But the lack of professionalism has been pretty profound, I would say, among these, this United squad, among these United players. And actually, <laughs> just an ability to work hard. They don't seem to want to do it. Let's read through this. As I said, there's a lot of detail in this article that we need to speak about. He's claimed that some, this is what uh, Steve Bates is saying, he's claimed some players have blatantly hid, ignored his instructions when he's given them a pattern of play to employ in certain games. Randnick has also told Murto and Arnold that many of United's players are not fit for purpose and physically cannot cope with high-energy opponents who run further, faster and harder. And that's why he's told Arnold the club needs a clear-out 
and an influx of hung, y- hungry young players. Rannick has also advised Man United's hierarchy to ditch their habit of signing big-name players for a short-term fix. Um, even told staff at the club he believes former star and Sky TV pundit say right weird stuff, weirdly, that the team is broken. Rannick joined, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Jeez, filler there. A lot of filler. He's a, But yeah, the, it, if you're looking at signings that have gone wrong for United, my God, is it, the, the, the list of signings that have gone right for Manchester United is far shorter than the list of signings that have gone wrong. Uh, and so many of us have been saying it. Cavani is the prime example. Do you remember when we signed Edinson Cavani? Yeah, of course you do. We signed him on deadline day, right at the end of the transfer window. A man who was available on a free. A man who had been available on a free all year long. Manchester United effectively got to the end of that transfer window and said, you know what? We've not had a successful enough window. Who's available out there that can come in and... Cavani's available, isn't he? Yeah, bring Cavani in. That's the conversation that happened behind the scenes. There's no way that you know, I went into this, that summer with Cavani's name at the top of it because if Cavani's name was top of the list, we'd have got him for free very easy. Instead, it was a plaster covering the gaping wound with a single plaster. That's what, that's, that, that's what that was. And it's what United have been in the window. Agarlo and Cavani are two examples of that. But there are loads and loads of others. And... We do need such a clear out. I did a video, what was it like, three, four weeks ago, where I did a tier list. And I, I ran through every position, every player in the squad. And the people I said, you know what? These are the players I think Ten Hag will keep. These are the players that Ten Hag will probably sell. I could probably even do an updated one with even more players on that sell list now. It just seems to be getting worse and worse. And when your backs are against the wall, that's when you identify your real leaders. When you're having problems... That's when your leaders come to the to the fore to help, you know, lead. And that's when the leaks and the moles, they become so much more apparent. Um, Sandeep, you're saying, Ralph took a bullet for Eric Ten Hag and exposed all the players. And this is something I've said to you all along. Right? I said, and I feel really, really strongly about this. It's why I did my video yesterday. You saw that one. I released it on Sunday morning. I said, United have got to listen to Ralph Radnick. Because we could have finished this season... If we had got Antonio Conte instead of uh, instead of Ralph Ragnick and instead of Eric Ten Hag coming in this summer, we would have been going down the Conte path, just like Spurs are doing. Uh, good luck to them. We would have probably finished this season inside the top four. We would have, who knows what would have happened in the Champions League. There's no doubt that the football would have gone far better than it has under Ralph Ragnick. But the club wouldn't be in a better position for it. Maybe we would have been even better if Michael Carrick had stayed. But I don't think the club right now, as it is today, would be in a better position for it. What Ralph Rannick is doing now, if he, if he didn't do this, the first three to six months of Eric Ten Hag's reign would have been a painful assessment from him. He would have tried to get a lot done in preseason and having that preseason would have allowed him to do that. So maybe it wouldn't have lasted as long as three to six months. Maybe he would have learned stuff very, very quickly. But Rannick is giving Eric Ten Hag such a leg up, a big foothold inside Manchester United before he's even come through the door. And that is going to help Ten Hag so much. So I genuinely think it really is such a good thing what, what Rannick is doing here. He's not doing it in the same style as Jose Mourinho. Players aren't getting thrown under the bus. He's still actually not even naming names. He's still talking about overall patterns of play, overall habits, and overall attitudes. You can, you know, a lot of indirects are going on. But Ralph genuinely is kind of speaking like a United fan. That's what's making me so in support of what he's doing at the club and why I will continue to support him until hopefully he steps into inside this um, consultancy role and he actually gets a bit of power there. Super chat coming in from Chris. He's saying, I'm just happy that we finally have a manager who doesn't give a toss about the board or players and exposes all their shenanigans. Excellent use of the word shenanigans. This is a real step towards a new and better United. And Ian, you're saying, I think Ralph has pulled the pants down for a few people, even the upstairs structure. If he doesn't get listened to, he'll expose the glazers. I mean, we all feel the same, man. We all feel that I've always called it root cause analysis because that's exactly what it is. 
Root cause analysis is where you've got a problem. And you think it might be that thing on the surface. You're like, oh, let me fix that. It's like, oh, it's fixed it. But then a few weeks down the line, tomorrow, in a month, the same problem resurfaces. You're like, ah, maybe that wasn't the fix. That's what Ralph Rannick is doing here. Instead of instead of just going, Man United need a new midfielder. Man United need a new striker, a new midfielder. That will solve the problems. We all know that it won't, right? And what Ralph is doing here is exposing, trying to get to the root of the problems. We know that the root of the problems is the Glazers. And they're not coming out of this with any sort of <laughs> glory in any way, shape or form. All the fingers are pointing back towards them. But I'll tell you what, Richard Arnold said that he would delegate when he came in as the new CEO of Manchester United. And this looks like delegation. This looks like exposing painful wounds, even for those upstairs, as you say there. The board really are not coming out of these Ralph Rannick conversations looking very good. This has all happened under their watch. They were the people that ticked off in every signing and followed what managers were saying. So they're not coming out of this looking good at all. And this is just this is this is more than just a clear out of players. This is like a full, complete refurb of the inner workings of our club. And that is what has been needed for a long time. Colin, you sent a super chat here, my friend, uh, but you didn't put anything with it. So I'll try and keep an eye out for your name. Let me see if you put any other comments down here. Uh, onwards and upwards. Absolutely onwards and upwards, Colin. Um, but, oh, man, I've, I'm so excited about what comes next. I'm so excited because it, when, we're not going into this. Yeah, look, as all, all said, there, it's open heart surgery. It. The way that Ralph articulates things and the way he says it. I've said this before, right? What Ralph Randnick wants for his own legacy ties perfectly into what Manchester United fans need for the club. Because for Ralph Randnick to have a legacy at United, his legacy at United won't be the football that we've played since he came in. We've got the worst win percentage of any manager that we've had post-Fergie under Ralph Randnick. But he was never brought in as an interim manager. And genuinely, I feel sorry for you if you are one of those United fans, and I don't think you are, not in this, not in this community, but I see it all the time. Ralph Rannick's the worst manager to have, to have come to Manchester United, but the worst thing that could possibly have happened to us. I'm like, you are so narrow-minded and short-sighted to think that. And that attitude, at, at, that attitude is exactly the attitude that exists and has existed inside our board structure for a long, long time. Can't see the wood from the trees if you think that Ralph Rannick is the worst manager that we've had post Fergie. It's incredible. Alan, nice to see that. I think you've become I think you've been a member before, but if you haven't, welcome aboard. I'm pretty sure you have though. Um time for a yard sale. I mean, it's not a yard sale, it's a straight up utter refurb. Really is. It's like DIY SOS. Although thankfully we've got more than 72 hours to get it done. Uh, Abdullah, you've sent a super chat here, my friend, but um, you haven't said anything with it, so leave another comment. You don't have to put a super chat, and I'll try and read it out for you there, my friend. Uh, Andrew, you're saying we spent 130 million on a centre back and a right back who can't even play how we need. Time for our business to get wise. It's far, yeah, exactly, exactly that, man. Exactly. And, and as, as Danny says down here, he's preaching the truth here. What the heck with that glorified accounting and what he's done to Manchester United? It's BS. We're witnessing, we've, we've, Internally, we've been witnessing the downfall of Manchester United as fans for a long, long time. But what we're really seeing now is it's starting to really come out. The volcano is exploding and, and you can't ignore it anymore because it's not about spending money on players. It's not. As I said there, we spent 130 million on two players who really don't suit the system we're playing. And it's just incredible to see our manager be the man leading these conversations. It's not a journalist. It's not even a frustrated, grumbled player. It is our manager saying these things. And that empowers us as fans to keep doing what we're doing. There's another protest that's going on on Thursday. If you're going to the Chelsea game, make sure you go to the toll gate beforehand. I'll share details, but if you go on uh, the 1958's Twitter page, there's more coming. Ian, you're saying, hi, Sam. Ralph Rannick has opened the barn doors, saying what many people are thinking and saying it publicly. This is the change we want. Absolutely, man. This isn't just about, it's not just about being pissed off and frustrated that we're not winning the league and X, Y, Z. It's like we're so far away from aspirations of winning the league that this sort of 
open heart surgery, as Ralph Rannick called it, is the most necessary thing in the entire world. And the society are saying Robinson from Fulham will be a cheap option at left back, can still be developed. Tellers is a nightmare. Pulisic not getting any time either. Um, left back, if we're looking at uh, cheap options, I think we should be looking at Alvaro Fernandez. If I'm being completely honest, my friend, this is going to be a season where I believe two to three players from the academy will become first team regulars, um, even if even just inside the squad. Probably in an ideal situation, I would sell Alex Tellez and bring Alvaro Fernandez in as the backup to Luke Shaw. And if Alvaro Fernandez can take opportunities, come through, uh, then Alvaro Fernandez can probably establish. He's been playing with the under 23s. It's definitely a preseason where he'll get his chances. We'll see there. But look, let's go back to the article. As I say, look, it's interactive. I always read as many of your comments out as possible. But Ralph Rannick is... Ralph Rannick's the voice that we've wanted internally for a long time. We've always talked about football, people making footballing decisions. This is a, a 63-year-old man, as he, as he said himself. 60-plus. He's experienced. He's been in multiple clubs. He's seen how it's worked. He's seen how it hasn't worked. And he's established new processes inside Hoffenheim, inside Leipzig. And he was going to do the same thing, no doubt, a locomotive Moscow. But instead, he's doing it at Manchester United. And we've got to be thankful for that. Uh, or you're saying, what about Williams coming back? Um, Brandon Williams, I'm reserved on him. Brandon Williams really broke through played a couple of barnstorming games, but he never really, I don't think he progressed enough. Now, maybe I need to have a conversation with Jack Reeve from uh, Talk Norwich City, good guy, uh, and speak about Brandon Williams because I know he's been an impressive player there. Obviously, he hasn't been able to stop the rot there, but maybe I'll do that in the future. I'm not really sure if he's got a future in the club though, but James Garner, you know, you know, you, you can check you can check out my video I've done on academy players and I'll speak about the academy players more as the weeks progress, but let's get back to this article because there's still far more that we need to discuss from it. As I always say, Please drop a like on the video if you're enjoying yourself and subscribe to United People's TV if you are new. Uh, let's go back to it here. Um, blah, blah, blah. We've already read that bit. Let's go down here. In the space of less than five months, Randnick has seen at close quarters the mess that United are in and is happy to hand the reins to Ten Hag, who will leave Ajax next month. Radnick's murderous assessment, my word, of the current squad will make for bleak reading for him. The German doesn't rate defenders Aaron Wambasaka. Eric Bay, Phil Jones, and is unsure about Victor Lindelof's decisiveness and positioning. Uh, and Neil, you're saying Ralph is 64, not 63. Well, same as you. Well, it's a good age. Great age. Uh, that was an all right age. Anyway, back to what I'm saying here. What do you think about that? The idea that Randy doesn't rate Wambasaka by Jones and Lindelof. That's abundantly obvious. Literally, as soon as Radnick came in, wan got binned. Delo went straight into that starting 11. Obviously, he doesn't trust him. Eric Bailly. Phil Jones was brought in ahead of Eric Bailly away at Liverpool, despite the fact that Bailly has been fit for so long. It's obvious that he doesn't trust Bailly. I'll tell you what, I think it was obvious that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer didn't trust Bailly either. We know with that other game, when Harry Maguire was literally half fit, he played him away at Leicester. United lost, was it 4-2? And Maguire was at fault for at least two of the goals. And Bai was fit to play. There's two managers who haven't trusted him. Poor lad. I love Eric Bai to watch. But part of me is always like, mm, please don't, please don't. Oh, shit, he's done it again. He's that sort of player. Exciting to watch. But I don't want my centre-backs to be exciting. I want my centre-backs to be boring as hell. And for United to never concede a goal. Leave the excitement further up the pitch. But it's obvious that he doesn't trust wan And it's obvious that he doesn't trust Eric Bailly. Phil Jones, I think he's probably got more just trust in Phil Jones than there. And the idea that he's he's unsure about Victor Lindelof's decisiveness and positioning. I think Victor Lindelof, I'm not ruling Victor Lindelof off for Eric Ten Hag. I think he could grow into a decent centre-back. I think he's probably, I would say, keep Lindelof, keep Varane, I think ultimately we're probably going to keep uh, Maguire. But look, this is probably exactly why here. And this, I think I'm very, very worried about. is the point here that's being raised once you get past all the adverts. Radnick believes that Harry Maguire has carried the can for a series of inept defensive displays by the team, but feels that Manchester United's £80 million investment is so substantial 
that the club can't simply write off the England centre-back. In midfield, Rangnick has been shocked that United don't have the energy and physicality needed in the modern game, and he believes it's an area that needs an attention with at least two hard-running, high-energy recruits plus a playmaker. But that point there, we need to speak about. It's Harry Maguire. You let me know what you think about that. All down here in the comments, you're saying, I think it's unfair how Bay hasn't been given a chance at centre-back with all the injuries we've had and the poor performances by others. He's quality, in my opinion. Look, and Max, were you saying Bay isn't bad? He wasn't given much time. I agree with you the fact that Bay hasn't given, been given much opportunity, but obviously he's not doing enough in training to give, be given that chance. Ralph Rannick has absolutely zero reason to trust any of this defence. And still, he's not giving Eric Bay the opportunity. So Bay must not be doing something correct in training. It must be that. There must be something going on behind the scenes that we don't know and we can't know as fans, but something that Ralph Rannick sees. It is what it is. But that idea there with Harry Maguire scares the crap out of me because I'll be a little... I believe it's the truth. I think that Manchester United, I reckon there's internal, probably, you know, you can call it political pressure if you want, but I reckon there's pressure from above that Maguire will get turned around at the club. He cost 80 million at the club. We can't just write that off. Instead of sort of accepting the mistake that Manchester United made in spending 80 million, and everybody knew it at the time. As soon as the deal was announced with Maguire, everybody knew Maguire was overpriced. With the excitement that United fans had, we were like, well, I mean, it's, it's 80 minutes, not my money. I don't care how much he costs. And that's ultimately the truth. He doesn't really care. But when it starts to affect your club at this point, and instead of Manchester United saying, you know what? We made a mistake in Harry Maguire. Maybe Ralph Rannick's got some internal pressure to just give him as many opportunities as possible. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And saying down here, Glazers openly admitting they made a mistake. It's, um, of course, it's difficult to do. Of course it is. But this is a time for acceptance and public admission of, of mistakes at Manchester United. It's, every, every stone's got to be turned. And Maguire deserved to be dropped from the game against Arsenal. And I'm not, of course, what happened during the week was insane. Right, absolutely insane about Harry Maguire and the um, the bomb threat at his house. Some people got to fucking take it way too far. It's in, it, it, it's ridiculous. But from a complete footballing perspective, it was correct to drop Harry Maguire for that game against Arsenal. Was our defence any better? No, it wasn't. Did anybody expect our defence to be a bit better? I hoped it would. But nobody, no, no United fan looks at this. Um, defence and goes, oh, Harry Maguire's the only problem. We look at this defence and go, sell Tellez. The lot, probably sell the lot. Varane, he can stay, but he's been pretty bad this season. Hasn't, you know, injuries X, Y, Z. Lindelof, questions. Maguire, there's basically not one of these defenders that you can say with any, like, hand on heart, I 100% trust that defender to be in that team next season. So no one's, no one's ever said Maguire's being the only problem, but when you are the captain, you are a bigger problem because you represent the overall expectation of what every player should do. And if your level is a, a three out of 10 and you're the captain and you're still getting played every week, it shows the other players, we can all play three out of 10s and we might still play next week. Mm, absolutely. That, that's, that's what I think here. Uh, all defense support, uh, says Neil. Let me see down here in the comments. Maguire must go. Fitness is by his issue. Of course, fitness is by his issue. Um, that's a shame, man. Absolute shame. I really, really thought that he was an absolute... When we signed him, from, I think it was Villarreal, wasn't it? I was like, my God, we've actually got a, we've actually got a centre-back with pace. I was like, oh! Uh, but obviously, injuries have really curtailed him. Poor lad. Poor lad. Um, Reggie, you're saying Rice and Benningham would change United into a into a four team. I don't know what that means. The top four team. We're not signing Rice and Bellingham. We're not signing Rice or Bellingham. Both of them are way overpriced for what United need to be doing this summer. That's what I think. But look, on the subject of Harry Maguire, there's something I quickly want to speak about because it happened at the weekend and a couple of people, was it Sunday? And a couple of people sent it to me. It was an article written in the Times 
by Rod Little. Harry Maguire is just a convenient conduit for crybaby Manchester United fans with the IQ of a shrubbery. And inside this article, United People's, United People's TV was mentioned. And what he's done is he's obviously typed in Harry Maguire on YouTube and, and a couple of the videos that have come up with the conversations that I've had on Harry Maguire. And there's, yeah, there's literally thousands of comments. It's kind of, it's pissed me off because what this article is insinuating is, is that that's my, that's what I've been saying. He's, he's kind of handpicking bad comments and it now reflects on United People's TV. And as I said, this is an art that this is an article which is geared towards um, standing up for Harry Maguire and the abuse that he's receiving. Whilst at the same time, he literally said, "All Manchester United fans who think like this have got an IQ of a shrubbery." So he's abusing every single fan, whilst also trying to be annoyed at Harry Maguire being abused. It's just it's fucking stupid. It's ridiculous. And by and by the way, if you want to go to character assassination, right? <laughs> you started this, Rod. This is a man who wrote this article inside The Guardian, which is still online. Nah, mate. I don't think I'll be listening to anything that you be saying, Rod Little. All right, so you can keep your... Uh, keep my name out of your mouth. <laughs> as Will Smith might say. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't even plan that joke. Found it quite funny. Uh, but look, I just wanted to say that. Weird bloke. Very odd. Very odd article. Uh, let's go back to this story, right? Um, Harry Maguire deserves, from a footballing perspective, Harry Maguire deserves every single bit of criticism that he's come his way when we're talking about how he plays for Manchester United and what he's been doing as a captain. Harry Maguire deserves zero abuse as an individual, as a person, as a human being outside of the football pitch. Unfortunately, that sort of, um, that blends online because people are empowered online to say whatever the fuck they want without consequence. It's a big part of the dangers online. And we all know that, right? No way. But, I don't know. I can't wait for Eric Ten Hard to come in. I can't wait for this narrative to change for us to actually read this i suppose this is just going to be as painful as it gets what we're seeing now is just like we're peeling off the plasters the, the scabby crusty plasters we're like oh and seeing what's underneath and there's so many plasters it's like oh constantly that's 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 what it is at manchester united at the moment and it's painful to watch as a fan but it's the sort of open heart surgery that we need we need to get rid of all these plasters we need to let air at the wounds we need to Get rid of it, clean it, move on. At the moment, we're in the process of pulling all the plasters off. Not really very pleasant, but also very necessary. In attack, Ralph Rannick believes United had big problems despite Ronaldo's 20 goals this season. He's told Murto that signing players like Cavani at the end of their careers and Odian Igalo is short-sighted and a sticking plaster strategy that has no future. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, Mount. You have any breakfast whilst listening to that? Yeah, that was probably quite a, a visual representation that I did. <laughs> I apologize about that. But look, Ralph is completely spot on here, man. It's time that United stop looking and going, how about Renamel Falcao? Yeah, it might work. He's a big name. Yeah, let's try it. Ah, oh, it didn't work. Ah, oh, damn. Never saw that coming. Odi Nagalo. Odi Nagalo. Nice bloke. Cracking goal away at Las Glins. Odi Nagalo. Edinson Cavani on transfer deadline day. If we'd signed Cavani five years earlier, it would have been a great signing. If we'd signed Falcao five years earlier, it would have been a great signing. Zlatan Ibrahimovic. A little bit different with Zlatan. Um, that, he was great that season. He was an injury away from scoring 30 goals. So I'm not, I'm not, I can't really put Zlatan in that same category. But in the same sort of sense, it's a short-term strategy based on winning success in the next year or two and then moving on. You're not building a club for the future. You're building a club for right now, which is what Mourinho loved to do. Uh, and stop the quick... And that's, and that's what it is. It's stopping the quick fixes. It's stopping the short-termism and the narrow-mindedness of just looking at the season ahead and saying, right, where do we want to be in three, four, five years' time? 
That's what we have to do. Schweinsteiger, I probably have to I have to put him in the same category because when we signed Schweinsteiger, we were like, oh, I he'd probably be my dream midfield signing for like, I don't know, at least three years of being like, oh man, if we had signed Schweinsteiger in his pump, boy. but of course we wouldn't because Bayern Munich wouldn't have let him go. And when we had signed him, he was just a bit past it, right? Same sort of thing. Don't try and put Van Persie into that same category, by the way. We lost the league on goal difference and we went and signed the best striker in the league and we won the league next year. Ooh, incredible signing. But look, uh, Ralph Rannick is banking on Ten Hag getting more from Marcus Rashford and Jaden Sancho, but believes United need a main striker with Martial unlikely to be the answer. The dossier will make for grim reading for Ten Hag, but Radnick, who will move upstairs in a consultancy role, is adamant that United must address their problems now or face more years in the wilderness. It's true, man. It's absolutely true. I think, I think that's the end of the article, actually. We're at that stage now, and we've spoken about crossroads quite a lot here on United People's TV. We've spoken about crossroads a lot. We've spoken about false dawns. There's been too many of them. This now is the biggest we'll ever get to because we're in a position as a club. We're in a position as a club to actually change that. This is where change, true change, no more the plaster's being pulled off and another shiny new plaster put on and all of a sudden it doesn't work in a few months' time. It just, it needs to change. And more, more change is needed. But look, that was the article that was released by Steve Bates. And as I've said, there's really no smoke without mirror. In the same weekend that Jesse Lingard was saying that the dressing room is a disaster, Paul Scholes was re revealing that. And Scott McTominay said that there's a whole load of problems in terms of players and staff and anything higher up at Manchester United. As Gary Neville said there, whilst not something that we didn't know, it tells you how bad it must be for the players to say it on air. That's the situation we're in right now. And that, for me, is why I don't think you can um, truly just go ahead and dismiss this because it was written by Steve Bates. Right? Maybe he took advantage of the situation and created a bit more detail on the narrative of what's going on. But the problems still remain the same. And we know they are there. And we all know that Ralph Rannick is the man to help fix this club. He's got United's best interests at heart, far more than that board does. And that's why I will support Rannick until the very end and support Rannick until this consultancy role. And what you're seeing now is maybe not. Maybe, maybe This isn't the way I wanted it to go. But this is why I was so excited about Ralph Randick coming in. Because I could see that. I could see that integrity and that honesty inside him. I didn't think that it would get as bad as this. Hand on heart. I thought United would respond to his management. They haven't. The players really are just massively, massively, massively entitled. There's nothing else you could say about them. And it hasn't gone right. But to see him speaking so publicly, openly, and as I said, it's not doing this in a... um. There's not really any disrespect towards it. There's no, he's not really throwing shade at any individuals. He keeps speaking about the club, overall attitudes, overall approaches, the whole squad. It's not about, ah, uh, no, remember when he said, ah, um, oh, what was it? I think he was talking about McTominay in a positive sense, but it, he was saying, I, I can't remember what he did, but I just like what Ralph Randnick is doing. And he's doing what we have needed as a club for a long, long time. But more is still needed, ladies and gents, right? More is still needed. Uh, could we see a new captain under Ten Hag? I'll head down to the comments for a minute, and then I'll move on to my next point. There's still lots to discuss this morning. So what is what is the case of Manchester United right now? There really are just so many talking points and so many different angles that you've got to keep covering. Could we see a new captain under Ten Hag? I absolutely think we will. I absolutely think we will. Now, Jeff, you're saying I've heard a deal could be close with Mitchell. He definitely needs to come in. I've got a bit of a concern about Paul Mitchell. That was my next talking point. Thank you for the comment there, my friend. And make sure, as always, everybody, you get in, you want to get involved, you get your comments in. I'll try and read as many comments as I can out. This is from David Ornstein and from The Athletic this morning, saying that Manchester United looked at Dean Ashworth before he moved to Newcastle and became their technical director. Now, Dean Ashworth, he worked for Brighton, uh, was pretty successful there. But if you go down here, this is a bit of an issue. Although, although it did not constitute a formal approach for uh, him, 
They looked whether or not he would be attainable. Any appointment would have needed to fit within Manchester United's existing setup, and it is improbable that that would work for either side. Which leads me to have a bit of fear. I've got I've got a bit of fear. I did this a while ago now. Ten Hag, Radnick, and Mitchell. The idea that those three three musketeers, whatever you want to call them, that they could have really steered Manchester United into a new direction, out of the shadows, and start going towards the light as a football club. But that little snippet there from David Ornstein is saying any appointment would have needed to fit within United's existing setup. We know what our existing setup is. That is uh, John Murto as the director of football, and that's Darren Fletcher as a technical director. It's not the same. Like If you're looking at a technical director, Dean Ashworth, and what he's doing, did at Brighton and what he's going to do at Newcastle, that's a technical director, not Darren Fletcher, who's a glorified semi cut. I don't, I don't know what Darren Fletcher's job is. I really, really don't. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. There's just not clarity on it. He's got his fingers in all the pies. He doesn't really know what he's doing in any, any of them. But he's got a great work ethic, so he'll just do them all. I just don't know what he's doing. But the idea that maybe Dean Ashworth wouldn't have come to United because he didn't want to work underneath John Murto and he, inside the existing United structure, I fear that about Paul Mitchell. I've gone on record to say that. I don't know why Paul Mitchell would go from being literally the sporting director at Monaco, controlling everything at the club, to all of a sudden working underneath John Murto, a man who doesn't really have experience, although a man who I would say seemingly is doing a good job. Given the decisions we've made, Jim Lawler, Marcel Bout, Brandit coming in on an interim basis, and Ten Hag this summer. I think he's doing a good job from the facts that we can see, the decisions that he's made. But I'm not sure why Paul Mitchell would leave all of that and come in and work underneath John Murtagh. Now, of course, this is United. When it's United, the call is different. The lure is different. And Paul Mitchell, again, if he's got the same sort of ambition as Eric Ten Hag, how amazing would it be to be the man to come into Manchester United and really and utterly tear United's recruitment policy up and completely change it and be part of that club that all of a sudden does what Liverpool did with Klopp or Guardiola. Eh, Guardiola is a little bit different, but kind of the same, but more towards what Klopp did with Liverpool, flip their recruitment and all of a sudden, instead of their signing players like Andy Carroll, Stuart Downing, Voronin and whoever else they spunk money on, they went out and started signing the likes of Sadio Mane, Mohamed Salah, Van Dijk, Allison, and look at the team they've got now. Mitchell, I would love for him to have that sort of ambition to want to do that at Manchester United. But I fear that I don't know whether he wants to sit inside this structure. As it stands, like David Ornstein said, I think it was about two weeks ago now, he said there will be, there will be more clarity very soon on the, the, on the deputy directorate role at Manchester United. Okay? That should probably be coming in the next week or so, I think. Next week or two weeks, it should be coming out. Ten Hag is done and dusted. Now the club can focus elsewhere. And that deputy director is one of the key missing pieces of this structure, this new structure we're building and what's going on with recruitment. And that's why Paul Mitchell, Paul Mitchell can probably replace, maybe not replace the scouts, but oh, we need it, man. We need it. We need it. I love it. For, whether it's Paul Mitchell or not, there should be at least one more appointment to Manchester United's structure before next season starts. I just want it to be Paul Mitchell. Uh, Paul Mitchell's a United fan. I don't know. Is he a United fan? Uh, Mitchell's from Manchester. Obviously, Mitchell, I think his family's in Manchester. I think he, he might be from Manchester as well. I'm not sure. Um, Marich, Mitchell as a director of recruitment, semi-independent role. Uh, that I think right now the head of recruitment is Steve Brown. Uh, but again, if you're looking at uh, people who have been involved in the failures of the last few years, anybody who's been involved in our transfers has been a failure. So Steve Brown, Jim Lawler, Marcel Bout. There's another couple of people too, but they're definitely all involved in the failures of it all. Absolutely are. Lilla, oh, nice to see you joining this morning. Where are you watching from, Lilla? Welcome to the family. Welcome to the community. community. Any, any members, by the way, if you have joined, make sure you go over to the community page uh, and follow the link there for WhatsApp group. We'd love to have you join the WhatsApp group as always. And quickly before I do move on, I want to share one more thing here. Ba -ba 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 -ba, because, of course, as you know by now, I'm slowly delaying so I can get the link up. This is a bit painful. Oh, we've got it on screen. Today, we're going to be recording the first episode 
of the brand new United People's TV podcast, all right? So I'm going to share this down here. If you could, please follow that. Oh, damn it, the stupid thing keeps leaving spelling mistakes in. Anyway, that's the link to the podcast. If you listen to your podcasts on Apple or Spotify, follow that link there uh, and go and follow the podcast. And if you can, just leave a little five-star review. Anything that will help the podcast get off on its way. Because it's, it's going to be difficult. There's lots out there, but I'm pretty confident that the podcast we'll be putting out will be very good. You'll enjoy it, entertaining as well as insightful. Lots to talk about at the moment. So it'll be me, Alex and Neil, recording the first episode tonight at 8. And that's going to go tomorrow morning. And it should be out every single Tuesday morning. Uh, what else have we got to talk about here? Oh, of course. I at the weekend. We can't not talk about our new man, Eric Ten Hag. If you watched that game there at the weekend, I was it Neck? I think it was it Neck better. They were struggling, absolutely struggling. But Brian Brobby came in and absolutely scored an 80, 88th minute winner. Woo! Oh yeah, the podcast is available on Apple's and Music. Yeah, it is it is available on Amazon Music as well. Um, I'll be getting it all. I'm just waiting to get it on Amazon Music. I don't know whether it's done now. It might be done now. But look, it'll be on there too. But Brian Brobby coming up with the goal that made sure that Ajax stayed top of the Eredivisie. They've got four games left now there. Ajax and PSV. They've got a four-point lead with four games left. And you know what? Interestingly as well, PSV have got to play Feyenoord away. Imagine that. Feyenoord away. So they've got four points there. Was it? Three more wins and they've won the league. Two more wins? No, you can get rid of... No. Three more wins and they've won the league. Absolutely. I hope that he can do it. I really, really hope because I really want to go to Amsterdam and join in, the, join in the celebrations. And look, Ian Woods here. Timber was really... So, Timber was an absolute baller in that game. Haven't watched that much of Timber. What, what I have seen is... Timber is a very, very good player. Very good player. Warren, you're saying, Hi, Sam. Hope all is well. Going slightly off topic here, but what is this news about the government wanting to reform men's football? Does this impact foreign ownership of clubs? Sorry for going off topic. Um, um, if, if that's anything to do with reforming men's football, that's going to go back to what happened after the European Super League, but we're yet to see any sort of proper change there, Warren. Uh, I don't think it would impact foreign ownership, but it will be, you know, the fit and proper owners test that they apparently do and they still do, which I don't really know they they actually do. It probably would be more re restrictions and regulations like that, but I don't think it would affect uh, foreign ownership too much. It might be more difficult to start it. Lila, your first comment here saying, who should be our head of scouting? Scare will once again recruit the wrong people. That should be down to Paul Mitchell. Paul Mitchell's not... Uh, I mean, yeah, he was a chief scout at Leipzig. I think he was a chief scout at Spurs as well. Paul Mitchell is somebody who can come in and basically fill quite a lot of the roles that Jim Lauder and Marcel Bout left behind and also be a deputy director. Oh man, it'll be good. Out, it'll be good. Out of the three IX strips this year, that that kit is my least favorite. It is, man. I sh I, that's what I need to buy. Actually, why haven't I bought one yet? Should buy that uh, Bob Marley kit. I love that kit. But look, um, if anybody's got any questions, you let me know. You fire it in the comments now. For the, next, the last few minutes of every stream, I just answer your questions as I always do. But this is what Eric Ten Hag said when he was asked about the IX defeat. He said, "I don't have any opinion about Manchester United's results." Because I show respect for the people who are at United and I'm responsible for Ajax. And that is what I comment on. Absolutely should be the case. Uh, and unfortunately for, <laughs> for Eric Ten Hag, the British journalists are allowed in to the press conferences now. So he's just going to keep getting the um, questions and questions about United. And there's only four games left, though. There's only four games left till the end of the season. And I hope it finishes with a title for Ajax. That would be a lovely way for it to end. Obviously, it didn't end with a domestic double because obviously PSV beat them in the final. But let me go down here and read a few of that. It said, the kit is sold out, says Woodsy. I'll find a way. Don't worry about that. Um, hello, you say, hello from Norway. How are you doing, buddy? The demos must show support to Rannick, especially after Rannick saying they haven't talked about his role. Uh, the demonstrations won't be about anything to do with managers, players, anybody inside the club, apart from getting the owners out of it. So that nothing will be associated with Rannick. Nothing will ever be associated. That, that's not the correct way for that protest to go. So I'd actually disagree with that. It's all about the owners and the Glazers and the movement against them. And it won't change. Um, saying, and saying, I still won't ever feel entirely comfortable until, unless the Glazers openly come out and say they are splitting the club and allowing the football people. They won't do that. That's not, that's not how 
businesses work. They rarely come out with something so publicly as that. And the Glazers don't speak to us in the public. They never have. They never will. Their own is in the shadows. Fuckers. Uh, Hannah saying, are you coming to Australia for the Australian Friendly Games? I would absolutely love to, but it would cost an arm and a leg to go there for those games. Ridiculous amount of money. I'm not sure I could afford that. Sam, you're saying, who, uh, thoughts on a coaching setup? Who would you want in? Personally, I don't like ex-players, coaches back, a new era and a new structure. Uh, the coaching structure we're definitely going to have is Eric Ten Hag and Mitchell van der Gag. And past that, we don't know. Eric Ramsey, I, would be, I wouldn't be sad if he left. Um, who else we got? We've got, we got a goalkeeping coach. Again, I'm always surprised that he left, considering that the fact that De Gea plays a very different style of goalkeeping to what Eric Ten Hag will want to have in place. Uh, Mike Phelan should be leaving. Our feeders and Mike. Uh, I'm not too upset about the ideas of other people coming back. As I said, Steve McLaren, I understand it if he comes in, and I understood if Ten Hag wanted him in, because he doesn't know Steve McLaren from his time at United. He knows Steve McLaren from his time at FC Twente, and the relationship that they built there. So to build that on top of the fact that he knows Man United. It's sort of, it's somebody who Ten Hag could lean on. If there were things that were concerning him and, and he didn't, who, who could he turn to? If there were things that Ten Hag was struggling with inside United in the first few months and he needed some advice, who does he turn to? Is he going to turn to his assistant? No, his assistant will be looking towards him for help. He could be a sort of mentor. Now, of course, he could turn to Ralph Radnick, but I don't know how directly involved Radnick's going to be on a, on a monthly basis. So maybe someone like Ten, maybe McLaren makes sense. Um, and look, Muellenstein could be another person that could come in. Let's see. We don't know who that third mem that third person is going to be, fourth person is going to be, but I think what we know it's going to be is Ten Hag and, and Mitchell van der Gag. And I would probably assume at this point, Steve McLaren too. And then let's see who that fourth or maybe the fifth one would be. Uh, Mario, you're saying Timber will 100% join United. That would be a lovely, a lovely saying. A lovely bit of news. Chris, you're saying there's been news that Mitchell van der Gag might be staying at Ajax. There's actually news last week that came out that Ajax had actually offered him the job. And he turned it down. I think he'll be coming to Manchester United. I think given what's happened at Liverpool with Klopp, and again, I hate to use the comparison, but that's not me not being able to see the wood from the trees. I can see what someone's done correctly and what I am jealous of and what I want my club to do correctly. So, of course, I will talk about it. It's foolish not to. Um, he's probably looking at it and going, I've seen what Klopp has done with Liverpool. Ten Hag could do the same thing at United. I want to be part of that party. I think so anyway. Uh, Klein, you're saying, I personally feel that uh, if we had Mitchell, we would have a lot of pre-contracts before the window. Maybe we would. Uh, and Stiff, and you're saying, is there a possibility that a former player will be involved? Neville Scholes, Keane, or Van Persie? Uh, none of those four. Neville won't come back. Scholes, not capable. Um, I don't think, anyway, might be, might be harsh for me to say that, but not from what I've seen. Keane, I don't think he'll want to be involved in United. Not, not yet. And Van Persie, he can't become involved in United because of work permits right and Tafey going with a comment of the day I love your haircut jeez it's basically as close as I'm going to get to Eric Ten Hag's haircut but look I know it's not an enjoyable time for United fans at the moment in terms of the results in terms of what we're seeing with the players and the disconnection that we've got with our club but for me personally I'm not the only one who's been doing this far from it so I'm not going to, I'm not trying to champion myself here, but I've been arguing and vocal against the Glazers, against the structures within our club for so, so, so long that I'm so excited to be seeing this sort of approach from our manager in the press to see him not throw people under the bus, but do things diplomatically and correctly, respectfully, but correctly. And hopefully it now starts because he's the leading voice internally. We've, it's like we finally got a mole inside the club and no one knows about it. But everyone does know about it. It's Ralph Ratnick. He's not a mole. He's just saying the truth. What us fans have been arguing for so long. And that combined with Eric Ten Hag coming in and I would say the best managerial appointment we could have made. Absolutely. I'm delighted with what's coming next. And I think this stage that we're going through, this is a necessity for that with Ten Hag to be successful. It's not It's not enjoyable. I know it's not enjoyable. It's not pretty. But it's needed. That's a big, big difference. But look, thank you very much for joining in this morning. I'm, I'm sure you didn't enjoy this uh, therapy room, as I've called it, across the whole season. But as I said, these sorts of 
If you want to do root cause analysis, you've really got to dig down. You've got to pull out all the weeds. You've got to pull them all out one by one until you've got rid of them all, put some fresh soil down and start again. That is what is happening at the moment. United are bleeding as a club, but we need to stop that. And I think that's what Rannick ultimately is trying to do and make and give Eric Ten Hag the best possible situation to walk into. Because if Ralph wasn't doing this, Ten Hag would have had to do this himself. And that would have made the start of his reign a lot tougher. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining in this morning. Um, purchase that red sofa, Sam. We need it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good idea. I like that sofa, though. Really quite comfortable. Uh, but look, thank you very much for joining in. I appreciate all of you being part of the community. I love how we're growing. And I think good times are ahead, man. Maybe not in the next few weeks. Maybe not until the start of next season. Hell, maybe not even as the season progresses. But good times are ahead for United in the years coming up. And it's been a tough few years for United. So I'm medicine for dominating for so long. But let's see what goes on next. And I, I want Ralph to keep pushing, man. I wouldn't, I wouldn't begrudge him if he started naming names. Keep going, Ralph, because I swear to God, you've got the support of the majority of United fans. Keep going. Take it easy, everyone. Have a good day. And I'll be back later on today, by the way, with another video. As always, come on.